On Monday, November the 9th, 1891, at 9.28 in the morning, the fire engine house number one at Race and Commerce Street was alerted to a fire on the north side of 2nd Street in downtown Cincinnati. By the time Fire Chief Hughes arrived on the scene, he found the Ankin Picture Frame Manufacturing Plant at 134 2nd Street engulfed in flames. The fire began when a lamp ignited oil in the building's cellar, causing an enormous explosion. Of the three deaths that day, two Cincinnati firemen, Edward Anderson and Lieutenant William Bockledge, were killed when the ladder they were on broke in half as they attempted to contain the blaze. The other death was an employee at Ankin, William Myers. Myers had been trapped in the cellar when the fire started. By all accounts, Myers was a wonderful husband and the father of six children. He had been with Ankin for several years and learned the craft of furniture and picture frame making from his Prussian-born father. He was also very athletic and had just become a member of the recently formed West End Football Club. As news of his death spread throughout the city, Many charity events were organized to financially assist Mrs. Myers and the children, who, unlike the firemen's families, had no insurance to speak of. One of those events was a charity football game to be held at the Cincinnati Reds League Park on Thanksgiving Day, November 26, 1891, at 3 o'clock. The game was organized by Myers' friend James Keenan, who was the president of the West End Football Club. The West Enders would match up against the newly formed Queen City Football Club. More than 500 Cincinnatians attended, including members of several other athletic clubs in the Tri-State. Over $1,000 was raised for the Myers family, with the West Enders prevailing 5 to nothing. This match game was football in its infancy. Association rules were much different than the football we know today. The college game had only been around for a little over a decade and there were only a handful of football clubs in the Tri-State in 1891. With the success of the benefit game, athletic clubs began forming football clubs, and in a few short years there were football teams from Price Hill, Walnut Hills, the Cincinnati Gym Club, and clubs in Covington and Newport on the Kentucky side of the river. These amateur clubs drew fairly well and established a new football fandom in Cincinnati and the surrounding river towns. Their popularity combined with the rise of high school and college football, helped lay the foundation for professional football in the Queen City. By the dawn of the 20th century, Cincinnati, Ohio was in the top 10 of the most populous cities in America. Tucked in the Ohio River Valley amongst the sprawling hills, it was a blue-collar industrious town. The city was known worldwide for its beer and its baseball tradition. As America became more and more urbanized, the need for physical education became a priority. Athletic sporting clubs became popular in cities, towns, and villages across the United States, and Cincinnati, Ohio was no exception. And within these clubs, the sport of football was gaining steam as the athletic contest of choice, when baseball and the warmth of summer faded to fall. Cincinnati boasted many of these clubs, including the Gym Club, the Avondale Athletic Club, the Walnut Hills Athletic Club, Christ Church, and the YMCA, among others. Perhaps no athletic club was more important in the development of professional football in the Queen City than the Celts Amateur Athletic Club. Founded on February 26, 1907, the Celts Club was formed by the growing Irish population of the city that included many Miami University alumni. The football portion of this athletic club began that fall scrimmaging other local amateur clubs across the city and in greater Cincinnati. They played their games at League Park, home of the Cincinnati Reds. And by 1910, they were reorganized as a semi-pro club, joining the informal and loosely organized Ohio League. The Ohio League being a direct predecessor to the NFL. 
It has been reported that the Celts wore black as well as green and crimson in their 16 years of existence. Facing foes from across the state, like Dayton, Columbus, Carthage, and West Carrollton, as well as trips to Indiana to battle teams from Indianapolis, Fort Wayne, and Muncie, the Celts began to build a reputation in the early 1910s as one of the most formidable clubs in the Midwest. By 1913, the Celts were now playing their home contests at Redland Field and had established a core squad of homegrown talent, including the Bismeyer brothers, Alan Otto, from the University of Cincinnati, and the Foscola brothers, who had played for Ohio State. There was Captain Tilly Schusler, who attended Kenyon University, and Frank Lane. The Celts offered West Carrollton star Lou Partlow to a $20 contract to play one game on Thanksgiving Day against their arch rival, Christ Church. Partlow declined the offer, and the Celts and Church teams played to a 7-7 tie on a muddy Redland field. Partlow would go on to score the first ever touchdown in the history of the NFL as a member of the Dayton Club. He would also play a few games for the Celts in 1914. The Celts finished 5-2-2 in 1913 and 6-1 in 1914, including a 7-6 Thanksgiving Day win over Christ Church. 1915 saw a change in coaches when Denison University star Frank Marty took over the club and led them to a 4-1-2 record, including an upset of the powerful Muncie Flyers. 1915 also saw Hughes High School star Shiner Nabe become a superstar with the Celts. Many years later, Celt teammates would call Shiner Nabe one of the greatest athletes in the history of Cincinnati. But of all the players on the Celts, perhaps the most famous was George Rudabush. Although Newt Rockney gets credit for developing the forward pass in 1913, the Celts' George Rudabush did it in 1912 with Denison University. Rudabush began his pro career with the Cincinnati Celts in 1915, but when Jim Thorpe was playing baseball in 1916, Rudabush would go to Canton and take his spot and then travel back to Cincinnati to play for the Celts. Not only was George Rudabush a very athletic player, he was also one of the smartest of his era. One of the most talked about games in the Cincinnati Celts history was on October 29, 1916, known as the Pine Village game. Pine Village, Indiana had not lost a game in 13 seasons. That was 117 wins and zero losses. They faced the Celts before a crowd of 2,500 people in Lafayette. Late in the game, with Pine Village leading the Cincinnati club 6-2, the Celts were forced to punt. Rudabush then lined up behind the punter. Under the rules of the time, anyone lining up behind the punter was eligible to recover the kick as a free ball. After the ball was kicked, Rudabush sprinted down the field. Pine Village, not wanting to touch the ball for better field position, was unaware that Rudabush was eligible to recover it. George jumped in the ball and ran into the end zone, giving the Celts a 9-6 victory. Rudabush would serve with the U.S. Army during World War I and return to play for the Dayton Triangles in the very first NFL game. After leaving the game, he spent 73 years as an attorney in Cleveland, Ohio. When George Rudabush was later asked about his Cincinnati Celt playing days, he smiled. Those guys were the best, a bunch of wild Irishmen. The Cincinnati Celts finally made the big time in 1921, when they were asked to represent Cincinnati in the new American Professional Football Association, which would be renamed the NFL in 1922. The Celts management named Mel Doherty, the new center and head coach. Doherty got his football experience at the Great Lakes Naval Academy and was a teammate of NFL legend George Hallis. Unfortunately for the Celts and for Doherty, the 1921 season was the only pro season for the Cincinnati club. They went 1-3, their only win on October 16, 1921, a 14 to nothing shutout of the Muncie Flyers. 
In 1922 and 23, the Celts returned to semi-pro status, and after the 1923 season, they folded up shop. Forever a footnote in the early history of Cincinnati professional football. By the early 1930s, the United States was in the midst of the Great Depression. Ohio had an unemployment rate of 37%, not ideal times to start a football franchise. But three men, Bert Bell of Philadelphia, Art Rooney of Pittsburgh, and Dr. M. Scott Kearns of Cincinnati, had just that. On July 8, 1933, they walked out of a Chicago hotel room with an NFL football franchise in their pocket. Dr. Stearns, a Cincinnati Northsider, was the Hamilton County coroner and had served on the commission of the Greater Cincinnati Catholic High School League and was also the team doctor for Xavier University football. Kearns and his partner, William McCoy, the secretary of a Cincinnati investment securities company, recruited the help of the Reds baseball owner, Sid Weil, and secured Redland Field for home games. Of the three new NFL franchises, Cincinnati had the least amount of money to spend. Kearns was not wealthy, barely able to come up with the $10,000 franchise fee that was required for the NFL at that time, and signing top talent was going to be near impossible. But it was his dream to own an NFL team, so the roster for the 1933 season was going to be journeymen and castoffs. He immediately hired Al Rocky Jolly, who was signed on as head coach. Jolly was a well-traveled pro football man who had played for Akron, Dayton, Brooklyn, among many other teams. Kearns and Jolly traveled the country, carrying with them $100 contracts. On the home front, there was an anticipation that the Reds would sign local Xavier star John Sacco Wythe. But as Wythe later said, money was the issue. They talked to me about playing for them, but I got a lot more money coaching the freshman football team at Xavier that year. The 1933 NFL season opened up with two divisions, similar to baseball with Boston, Brooklyn, New York, Philadelphia, and Pittsburgh in the east. Two Chicago teams, Cincinnati, Green Bay, and Portsmouth in the west. The first game for the new Reds football club took place on a brutally hot day in Portsmouth Universal Stadium. The Reds only crossed midfield once and lost 21 to nothing. The following week, the Reds played an exhibition game against a semi-pro club from Troy, Ohio, winning handily 59 to nothing, with halfback Gil Pretzel Lefebvre scoring four touchdowns. On October the 8th, 1933, the Cincinnati Reds football club played the very first NFL game in the city of Cincinnati. 1,500 fans showed up at Redland Field, including the Shillitoes Reds Fan Club and high school bands who performed pregame and at halftime as the Cincinnati Reds took on the Chicago Cardinals. The cards were led by Joe Lillard, nicknamed the Midnight Express. Lillard would be the last African-American player until the mid-1940s, as unofficial segregation began following the 1933 season. The cards would shut out the Reds 3 to nothing on a Joe Lillard field goal. The Reds had a chance late in the fourth quarter, when former Purdue star Lewis Pope completed a 20-yard pass all the way to the 35-yard line with only seconds remaining. The Reds attempted a long field goal, which sailed wide right. When the cards took over, Joe Lillard ran a sweep to kill off the clock. Reds guard Les Kaywood, who had jawed with Lillard the entire game, threw him to the ground. Lillard jumped up immediately, landing a right hook on the chin of Kaywood. A scuffle between the two teams ensued. As the refs separated the pile, the scoreboard read 3 to nothing, and the Reds were once again on the short end. The Reds would be on the short end for the next two games, losing 17-3 at Pittsburgh and 27-0 at Ebbets Field in Brooklyn. In their first six games, the Reds only scored three points. Following a 6-0 loss to the Philadelphia Eagles, the Coach Jolly era ended as he was fired and replaced by assistant coach and backup quarterback Mike Palm. 
Palm, a former Penn State star, was signed out of college by the New York Giants. Palm made immediate changes to the offense, getting rid of the Notre Dame system and instituted an unbalanced line to better accommodate the strengths of the team. The Reds traveled to the Windy City on November the 12th, beating the Cardinals at Wrigley Field 12-9 for their first ever league win. Although effectively out of the race, the Reds continued to build upon the recent success, and on November the 29th, they stunned the Portsmouth Spartans 10-7 in front of 7,500 NFL fans at Redland Field, the largest crowd to witness a game in pro football history to that point in Cincinnati. The loss virtually eliminated Portsmouth from the race and featured an unusual play that, according to Red Corzine, decided the game. We won that game because we pitched Gil Lefebvre up in the air to block a field goal. We actually worked on it in practice. Another highlight in the Mike Palm era was a 98-yard punt return by Gil Lefebvre. Lefebvre was considered the smallest back in the NFL, and his 98-yard return set an NFL record which would stand until 1994. The Reds finished 3-6-1 and one after a horrible start, but looked to carry that enthusiasm into 1934 under Mike Palm. The late season hiring of Palm installed a new spirit into the Reds, a spirit best described by Jim Mooney. Mooney had been coached by Palm at Georgetown University, and the two had shared a special bond throughout their careers said Mooney after the 1933 season came to a close with a 13-0 win over the Brooklyn Dodgers at an exhibition game in Dayton that benefited charity. I have played a lot of football. You can talk about college spirit and the pros being in the football business just for what they can make of it, if you want. But I never saw a spirit like the boys on this Reds ball club had after Mike Palm took charge of us. He made us willing to die for dear old Reds and we worked so well together that some of the boys were nearly in tears when they left tonight. Going into the 1934 NFL season, hopes were high, but fate had other plans. A five-man ownership group bought the Reds from Stearns, who was in very poor health, and was moving to Florida. With new owners came a new philosophy, and unfortunately for Palm, a new coach. By August of 1934, as training was set to commence, the Reds made 30-year-old backup halfback Algie Clark their player coach. Clark was an Ohio State product and a journeyman NFL player playing for Brooklyn, Cleveland, and Boston, said new general manager Myron Greentree. We have picked the man whose abilities are outstanding and should be quite a success not only as a coach, but as an inspired leader of the Red Legs. But Clark, as hard as he tried, couldn't deliver on the momentum that had been established by Palm. The 1934 Reds were outscored 141-10. to Morale was dismal, and the attendance was so low that a home game burst of the Detroit Lions was moved to Portsmouth, the previous home of the Lions. On November the 6th, 1934, the Reds' NFL experiment came to an end. The Reds were sold to the St. Louis Gunners, an independent franchise, and they finished out the rest of their season. Only four players from that Cincy club were to report to St. Louis. The rest were given their outright release. The Cincinnati Reds football club was no more. Two years after the Cincinnati Reds football club left town, a new minor football league was formed, the Midwest League. It featured teams from Louisville, Indianapolis, Dayton, Columbus, Springfield, and two teams from Cincinnati. The models, named after a shoe company, and the Tresslers, named after Tressler Oil. The Cincinnati models were considered the strongest club in not just Cincinnati, but in the entire Midwest. Featuring several future NFLers, including John Sacco White, they were 6-0 in 1936 before losing the championship game to the Louisville Tanks 2 to nothing on a rain-soaked Louisville field. The Tresslers never reached the same success as the models. They were led by quarterback Harry Rose, the father of baseball great Pete Rose. The models were formed and coached by former Xavier star athlete Hal Pennington. His models club drew well in the Midwest Football League 
and even persuaded the independent Chicago Gunners to play a game at Northside Park, a game the models won 20-7. As 1937 dawned, Pennington was presented an intriguing offer. A group of Cincinnati businessmen formed the Queen City Athletics Incorporated Club in hopes of landing a pro football franchise in the AFL. The group asked Pennington to formulate a plan and a pitch. And on April the 18th, 1937, Pennington walked out of the AFL offices in New York City as the president, general manager, and head coach of the Cincinnati Football Club of the AFL. He was 24 years old. Pennington wasted no time in organizing his club and signed Bob Wilkie out of Notre Dame. The following week, he obtained the services of Don Geyer, star of Northwestern. A call was sent out to all talent across the Cincinnati area to appear at tryouts on August the 22nd at 9.30 a.m. sharp at the field on the grounds of the Tacoma Amusement Park on the riverbanks of Dayton, Kentucky. As training camp went into its second week, Pennington persuaded Ohio State legend Tippy Dye to sign. Not long after, Pennington was having a cup of coffee with his mother at her house. He noticed something intriguing on the stove in his mother's kitchen. The Bengal Tiger logo of the Floyd and Wells Stove Company out of Pennsylvania spoke to him. He walked out of that kitchen with the nickname of his new AFL team, the Cincinnati Bengals. With Crosley Field as their home, the Cincinnati Bengals finished 2-4-2 two, two in 1937. Only good enough for fourth place in the AFL. After the season, Pennington had hoped to continue to grow the Bengals franchise. But the league folded, leaving the Bengals to function as a professional independent team for 1938. He decided to hand the reins over to his friend Dana King. Meanwhile, the Midwest League home to the Cincinnati Models, changed their league name to the AFL, and the Models became the Cincinnati Blades, with Hal Pennington returning to his former club. Unfortunately, the club couldn't compete at the gate and disbanded in October. The 1938 Bengals, however, were good, very good. With most of the 1937 roster gone, the 38 squad featured Pat Hallett and Alton Owen, as well as John Cruz. Ten of the 32-man roster were from Xavier, including John Sacco White. The club secured the rights to use Xavier's Corcoran Field and packed them in. The team finished 7-2-1. In 1939, the Bengals rejoined a new AFL and finished in second place behind the LA Bulldogs with a 6-2 record. 1940, though, saw the Bengals completely collapse and they finished a league worst one and seven. Hal Pennington was lured to return to pro football as general manager of the Bengals in 1941. But the club went one and five in their rebuilding year. The last game the original Bengals ever played was against the New York Americans at Yankee Stadium on November the 30th, 1941, one week before the events of Pearl Harbor. The AFL planned to return in 1942 and the Bengals went about the business of rebuilding their club, scouring the nation for top talent and negotiating for the use of Crosley Field. As the season was set to begin, the AFL decided to suspend operations due to the war, with the promise to the league teams that they would resume at an appropriate time. It was a promise never kept, as the league never resumed and the teams faded into obscurity. In the 1950s, Reds general manager Gabe Paul contacted Hal Pennington about putting together a group in the hopes of bringing pro football back to the Queen City. But the talks went nowhere. Cincinnati would have to wait 27 years for Paul Brown to head south from Cleveland and form the Cincinnati Bengals. At a press conference in 1967 with Hal Pennington in attendance, Paul Brown said this, if we can pick up a thread of tradition, we think it's good. We feel at home with the name Bengals. In 